Hey, so before we get into today's episode, I just wanna let you all know about a secret little project that I've been creating behind the scenes. I've created a new channel called Thinkology on YouTube. If you like slightly shorter content than what I currently offer from time to time, where maybe not everything is always so depressing or sad, then make sure to check it out. While I'm not always voicing on it, I have sourced some amazing talent to bring this new project to life. On Mondays, we talk about history. On Tuesdays, we talk about creepy or spooky things. Nature is on Wednesdays, crime is on Thursdays, and trivia is on Fridays. So if any of that interests you, make sure to check out the link in the description box to check out Thinkology or just type in Thinkology in your YouTube search bar. We've talked about the prohibition and that spectacular failure. However, that's not the only time that the government has actually campaigned against a substance, only for it to backfire. Here in the United States, we've been fighting the so-called war on drugs for decades without a victor. In fact, we've been fighting it so vehemently that those that claim to be at the front lines have advocated for shooting casual drug users and bringing back whipping posts. But why? How did this war on drugs begin? And is there any end in sight? Well, hello everyone, I'm the Illuminati and welcome back to another episode of Prism of the Past. In today's episode, we're really gonna focus on the early years on the war on drugs, the Nixon administration and how it all came to be. Now, probably unsurprisingly, but today's episode does have a little bit of a content warning and that's going to be for discussion about murder, drug use, and racism. So if that's not your cup of tea, then this is not the episode for you. With that being said, let's get right into it. First and foremost, I think it's important to address the fact that no, it's not as if the war on drugs just banned everything at once and everything drug related was allowed in the US before that time period. Laws to ban or regulate substances in the US have been happening as far back as the 1800s. Some of these drugs were incredibly common ones too. Back in the 1890s, the Sears and Roebuck catalog literally sold a syringe and cocaine for $1.50. Cocaine had been an ingredient in Coca-Cola and heroin was used as a cough suppressant. However, even if we agree that some of these drugs can be problematic, what's as concerning is how the US went about tackling this so-called issue. Take the case of opium dens, for example. Back during the gold rush, thousands of Chinese people came to America and according to history.com, many of them brought with them the habit of opium smoking. By the 1870s, it was a popular habit and by 1875, San Francisco became the first city to pass legislation limiting its use. Now, here's the thing, opium had been used for ages by doctors. Regulation was restricting the sale more and more and doctors were learning not to rely on this drug. Yet, once Chinese immigrants emerged as having used these substances, things began to change. According to the Smithsonian, that shift created a political opening for prohibition. In the late 19th century, as long as the most common kind of narcotic addict was a sick old lady, a morphine or opium user, people weren't really interested in throwing them in jail. That changed in the 1910s and 1920s, when the typical drug user was a young, tough on the street corner, hanging out with his friends and snorting heroin. That's a very different and less sympathetic picture of narcotic addiction. And please don't misunderstand, I'm not advocating for the use of opium, and I'm not trying to say that it isn't a problem. But what is a problem is how doctors were encouraged to find better methods, help patients, and find a solution for addicts they encountered if they were white. However, if a Chinese immigrant was smoking opium, suddenly they were demonized. These concerns and fears weren't for the Chinese people becoming addicted or hurting themselves, but people believe that opium smoking might encourage prostitution or that white people may lose their jobs if they became addicts. Real devastating consequences came from this, including an anti-Chinese campaign that led to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, a 10 year moratorium on Chinese immigration. In 1909, the first laws in the US to prohibit the importation and use of opium for anything other than medicinal purposes arrived, followed by an amended version in 1914. Then in 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, which placed taxes on the sale of cannabis, hemp, or marijuana. 
Though it didn't criminalize marijuana, it simply meant that there were incredibly hefty penalties if these taxes weren't paid. But why was marijuana targeted? Why some other drugs like cocaine and heroin considered awful, whereas oxy was given for pain? Oxycodone can be extremely addictive and it's one of the most commonly abused drugs in the country. It's been called the most addicting prescription opioid on the market, even rivaling heroin. One study I found about it explains, A number of epidemiological studies have shown that oxycodone is one of the most widely abused prescription opioids. However, it is not clear from these studies whether the widespread abuse of oxycodone is due to the fact that it's easily available or whether something about its pharmacology makes it more likely to be abused. The present results suggest that the pharmacology of oxycodone is quite similar to that of other highly abused opioid medications, such as morphine and fentanyl to the street drug heroin. Of particular concern was the finding that oxycodone produced so few reports of bad drug effects, suggesting that its pharmacological profile coupled with its ready availability may contribute to the high prevalence of abuse in this particular medication. So then this brings us back to the question of why. Why did this war on drugs even begin? Was it ever about drugs to begin with? And chances are it wasn't. The first anti-opium laws in the 1870s were directed at Chinese immigrants, as we already mentioned. In addition, the first anti-cocaine laws in the early 1900s were directed at black men in the South. The first anti-marijuana laws were directed at Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans. And this was something that we've already talked about in a previous episode about how racism has affected how we view marijuana. And unfortunately, it's a similar story with these other drugs as well. Many of them aren't banned because of scientific assessment, but because of who is using them. Again, while I won't pretend that cocaine, opium, or heroin are safe, the laws created against them are massive racist double standards. And as we'll see in a little bit, this is hardly a war on drugs, but instead a war on people of color. So now that we've got a bit of background, let's take a look at when this war officially began with Nixon. One of the reasons Nixon cited for his declaration of the war on drugs was the fact that in 1971, many American soldiers in Vietnam had turned to drugs to cope with their struggles. About 51% smoked marijuana, 28% consumed heroin or cocaine, 31% used psychedelics like mushrooms or LSD. There was also excessive drinking and given that many veterans were ostracized and suffering from PTSD when they came home, their environment didn't really help anything out either. Personally, I'm of the belief that if someone is suffering from substance abuse, then finding resources, therapy, and outreach programs would be the best way to help. However, Nixon used this as one of the catalysts to declare a war on drugs instead, promising that he would prosecute pushers and treat addicts is his words. The day after Nixon declared the war on drugs though, some sources were already skeptical about how effective this could possibly be. The New York Times wrote on June 2nd, 1971, In general terms, this, the war on drugs is fair enough, but it does not deal with the tragic realities of the troops on the battlefield. The quickest way for an American soldier to avoid combat in Vietnam and get back home these days is to take drugs. If he's hooked on heroin, he's finished, finished with fighting, finished with the army, a casualty of the war, finished with everything but the drug habit. This is so serious a problem that unlike most political issues in Washington, it is beyond politics. Both parties, all factions for and against the Nixon policy of winding down the war agree on the human tragedy of drug addiction among the soldiers in Vietnam and the dangers of sending them back home before they are cured, but this is what is happening. To save their lives by avoiding combat, many of the Americans in Vietnam are ruining their lives by drugs and are being sent home to families and communities that have no means to cure or even understand the tragedy of their returning sons. Now, I wasn't alive in the 70s, so I won't pretend like I understand all the nuances of this issue from the mindset of someone that was hearing about this in real time. But from what I've read here, the New York Times was making the case that while yes, cracking down on substance abuse can and should be a thing, the way Nixon was going about it didn't address any sort of root to the problem. They claimed that in Vietnam, Nixon wasn't effective whatsoever in insisting that American soldiers be rehabilitated nor were they cooperative in a serious private examination of the Vietnam drug problem with Congress. The article adds, nobody on Capitol Hill expects the president to approve public hearings on the question, but serious men in the Congress, both critics and defenders of the president's Vietnam policy have urged him without success to get at the facts of drug addiction among the soldiers and cooperate in legislation to deal with the drug casualties of the war. 
if Nixon's motives were truly to help people, then wouldn't he want the most like up-to-date information he could possibly get his hands on? Once again, this shows that the war on drugs seemed to have ulterior motives. According to the New York Times article, $105 million was allocated for treatment and rehabilitation at the time, while Nixon also requested $14 million to expand their drug addiction clinics, 10 million for education and training, 2 million for research, 7.5 million for investigation of large scale traffickers, and 18 million for customs, inspections, and pursuing smugglers, 1 million for helping other nations train enforcement officers, and 2 million for research on herbicides that destroy narcotics. The immediate aftermath was, as you might expect, not exactly great. Drug abuse was called public enemy number one, and by 1973, the Drug Enforcement Administration was created when the Office for Drug Abuse Law Enforcement, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and the Office of Narcotics Intelligence all consolidated. But hey, all that research and those millions of dollars must have found that these drugs were truly dangerous and made sense to begin this war on drugs, right? Well, no, not really. According to drugpolicy.org, Nixon had placed marijuana in a schedule one category, meaning it was the most restrictive category of drugs, pending a review by the commission he appointed led by Republican Pennsylvania governor, Raymond Schaefer. And yet the commission unanimously recommended decriminalizing the possession and distribution of marijuana for personal use, but Nixon simply ignored the report and its recommendations. Seriously, how can Nixon lead a war on drugs, spend money on research, and then ignore the results? Rockefeller drug laws were put in place in 1973 as well, named after Nelson Rockefeller, the state's governor at the time. These laws were supposed to be tough on crime, but in reality, they were brutal. NPR discusses his decision in an article and writes, Rewind to the 1970s. New York City was battling a heroin epidemic. These were junkies on street corners. The homicide rate was four times as high as it is today. Rockefeller, New York's Republican governor, had backed drug rehabilitation, job training, and housing. He saw drugs as a social problem, not a criminal one, but the political mood was hardening. President Richard Nixon declared a national war on drugs and movies like The French Connection and Panic in Needle Park helped spread the sense that America's cities were unraveling. Late in 1972, one of Rockefeller's closest aides, Joseph Persico, was in a meeting with the governor. He says Rockefeller suddenly did a dramatic about face. Finally, he turned and said, for drug pushing, life sentence, no parole, no probation. Rockefeller launched his campaign to toughen New York's laws at a press conference in January, 1973. He called for something unheard of, mandatory prison sentences of 15 years to life for drug dealers and addicts, even those caught with small amounts of marijuana, cocaine, or heroin. And these so-called Rockefeller drug laws, these policies, they went essentially viral throughout the United States government. And these laws literally changed how we punish people for drugs all over the country. Back in the 1960s, drug addiction was a medical problem, not a criminal one, and it is still a medical problem. But it was this change in attitude with Rockefeller and Nixon, as well as their supporters, that turned the tides. Whether or not a judge wanted to or not, laws like this tied their hands, and they were forced to send out lengthy sentences for simple possession crimes. In November 1975, the war on drugs proved to have other enemies besides, well, drugs, the trafficking. By this point, attention was on Colombia's cocaine industry instead of heroin use, as it had been at the beginning. Colombian authorities seized 600 kilos of cocaine and drug traffickers responded by killing 40 people in one weekend. This event became known as the Medellin Massacre after the city at the center of Colombia's drug trade and the murderers ignited years of raids, kidnappings, and assassinations. Some sources such as the Seattle Times argue that the war on drugs is in many ways pretty similar to prohibition. When the government banned alcohol, people began trying to make industrial alcohol safe to drink. Crime erupted and this black market for the stuff emerged. Though it's on a different scale, it's not entirely unlike drug trafficking. As they put it, it would be difficult for anyone who lived under alcohol prohibition to imagine today's drug war related violence. Whereas the St. Valentine's Day massacre of seven alcohol trafficking gangsters in Chicago made international headlines in 1929, today's drug cartels regularly kidnap and murder police and other government officials, roll severed heads into nightclubs and hang mutilated bodies from bridges, complete with threatening messages carved into the flesh. The violence is so frequent that each grisly incident is but a blip on the radar. Just as in the 1920s, this violence stems from disputes over territory. Instead of bringing whiskey from Canada, organized criminals deliver illegal drugs from Mexico via a sophisticated network whose tentacles extend from our Southwestern border to more than 1,000 American cities. 
This isn't to say that there was absolutely no crime involved before Nixon's time. However, to go from being able to buy cocaine from a catalog and thinking of it as a medicine to it being an illicit substance, well, yeah, you're bound to have these trafficking demands. That's not to say that we should all be able to get cocaine shipped to our front door from Amazon or something, but once again, it's the way that this was handled that was questionable at best. We talked about how alcohol consumption did slow during the prohibition at first, but not only did it not last, but when rates rose, the alcohol people were getting their hands on wasn't regulated and was far more dangerous than the original stuff. Even if one country did manage to rid itself of drug cartels, because the drug trade is so lucrative, it will almost always provide an economic opportunity. In 2014, even when some drug trafficking was pushed out of Mexico, other cartels stepped up operations in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. The war on drugs drove a lot of the activities to Central America, a region that has extremely weakened systems. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a strong commitment to building the criminal justice system and the police. And because of this, children fled their countries by the thousands in a major humanitarian crisis. If drug production and trafficking goes down in one country, then it goes up in another. The United Nations found that not only is there violence associated with trafficking, but of course, other dangerous products too. New security strategies in Mexico in 2006 disrupted the cocaine supply to the United States. This forced dealers to cut purity, raise prices, all while the violence was not reduced. Research shows that even after five decades, this war on drugs has yet to prove itself as effective or cost-efficient for dealing with cocaine trafficking. In fact, the US has spent an estimated $1 trillion on drug prevention and enforcement efforts while researchers into the effect on cocaine say its supply and price hasn't even changed. Wholesale cocaine prices in the United States have actually dropped significantly since 1980. Deaths from cocaine overdose are rising and counter drug forces intercept cocaine shipments at a low rate. More cocaine entered the United States in 2015 than in any other year. So what exactly did Nixon's war on drugs actually do? Well, I mean, so far it's proven to be an effective way to flush money down the toilet, right? So why did this war on drugs, why has it been continuing on for so long if it's clearly not working? There was even a brief break from the war on drugs around the time that Nixon resigned from office. 11 states decriminalized marijuana possession and in 1977, President Jimmy Carter was inaugurated on a platform that included marijuana decriminalization. However, once parents became concerned about high rates of teen marijuana use and Ronald Reagan was elected, the war on drugs began again and rates of incarceration went through the fucking roof. The amount of people behind bars in the US for nonviolent drug law offenses was 50,000 in 1980, but by 1997, it was over 400,000. Public concern about illicit drug use built throughout the 1980s, largely due to media portrayals of people addicted to the smokable form of cocaine dubbed crack. Soon after Ronald Reagan took office in 1981, his wife, Nancy Reagan, began a highly publicized anti-drug campaign, coining the slogan, just say no. The DARE drug education program was implemented in 1983, becoming the most widely publicized teen substance abuse prevention program. Political hysteria regarding drugs was rising to the point where the amount of Americans who believed drug abuse was the nation's number one issue went from 6% to 64%. Yet there's a lack of any credible evidence that programs like DARE even work. The Reagan administration and their just say no to drugs attitude was incredibly effective at putting people behind bars, but on treating them, It doesn't seem that way. Some research does suggest that yes, the amount of drug use declined during those years from 25 million users in 1979 to 14.8 million 20 years later. Other sources suggest like abstinence-based sex education, the dare and just say no programs are only spreading fear and ignorance through dramatized anecdotal evidence and placing all responsibility on the individual while denying them the tools to make key decisions. So to use sex education as an example, if you talk openly with students about sex education and consent, the importance of birth control and getting tested, then there's less risk involved with unsafe sex. Whereas students that are only taught to be abstinent are far more likely to practice unsafe sex because well, they don't know any other way because it wasn't taught. The risk of sexual assault and STIs also increase. I would argue that the same thing happens when it comes to drug use. If teens aren't taught what drugs are, what they do and why they need to be careful, then how can they know to be careful? I'm not suggesting that drug education programs should be teaching students how to properly roll a joint or anything like that, but some baseline of safety as opposed to just sheer avoidance will help reduce high-risk behaviors. Even if you may scare a few children, those that do end up using even at a young age don't have resources and could potentially feel that they don't have any way of reaching out or asking for help. 
the just say no catchphrase genuinely didn't work and doesn't help. In fact, data shows that those subjected to D.A.R.E. programs are just as likely to use as those that aren't. A few clues to D.A.R.E.'s deficiencies come from psychologist Pim Keepers of the Netherlands Institute of Mental Health and Addiction. In a review of 30 studies published in 2002, she attempted to pinpoint the common elements of successful programs. She reported that the most effective ones involve substantial amounts of interaction between instructors and students. They teach students the social skills they need to refuse drugs and give them opportunities to practice these skills with other students. For example, by asking students to play roles on both sides of a conversation about drugs while instructors coach them about what to say and do. In addition, programs that work take into account the importance of behavioral norms. They emphasize to students that substance use is not especially common and thereby attempt to counteract the misconception that abstaining from drugs makes a person an oddball. Dare just plain and simple, didn't do this. If someone lacks the interpersonal skills to just say no like D.A.R.E. teaches, then what do they say? The Rangit administration's beliefs and D.A.R.E.'s beliefs have been doomed from the start because this isn't a black and white issue. You can't simply eliminate drug use by using a three-word phrase and fear tactics, but that's essentially all these students were given. One 1988 article from the Washington Post actually addresses these fear tactics that the war on drugs utilized and said not only was it damaging, but it was just plain untrue. Richard Cohen wrote for the Post when he was in elementary school, a teacher called Mr. S told his class that marijuana was an addictive drug and one puff would hook you, lead to heroin, and from there to horrors beyond imagination. He writes, "'We believed, but then I and countless others discovered otherwise. In the 1960s and 1970s, millions of people used marijuana. They include, by their own admission, Albert Gore, Bruce Babbitt, Claire Bon Powell, and Newt Gingrich. Three moderates and an arch conservative. Like millions of others, they did not get hooked. Based on the confession of record, the worst that can be said about pot is that it presents a one in four chance of turning a person into a right-wing zealot. This is not a plea in behalf of marijuana. I never touched the stuff, but it is a plea of sorts to a nation that seems intent on repeating a mistake. The lie about marijuana was the prerequisite to the tragedy of cocaine. A generation that was misinformed about marijuana was understandably skeptical when warned about cocaine. This time though, the horror stories were true. Coke is addictive, Coke can kill, and witness Len Bias, it has. But those who told the truth were handicapped. A generation that had discovered the marijuana lie could not recognize the cocaine truth. This became a sort of boy who cried wolf situation. Richard here argues that teens who were lied about the dangers of marijuana thought, well, if marijuana ended up being safe, then maybe their dare teachers were lying about cocaine. But as if these lies weren't bad enough, the racism and double standards surrounding cocaine are also something that's quite undeniable. See, in later years, Congress made the decision to hand out different punishments to powder cocaine versus crack cocaine. They claim that it's because violent crimes are more associated with the latter, even though these two are the same drug. Chemically, they are no different, but the punishment for crack possession is far greater than that of cocaine. In FAR, the sentencing disparity was so massive in 2010 that it was 100 to one. So if you had five grams of crack, you'd get a five-year minimum, but it would take 500 grams of cocaine to trigger the same sentence. The law has changed, but to this day, the disparity continues, not at 18 to one, but according to this source, they add. This sentencing disparity has a disproportionate impact on poor people and people of color. Statistics show that black people are more likely to be convicted of crack cocaine offenses, even though the majority of crack cocaine users are white, and white people are more likely to be convicted of powder cocaine offenses. This means that black people continue to receive far harsher drug sentences than white people, even though powder and crack cocaine are nearly identical substances. The New York Times pointed out in early 1995 and posed the question, how can you go into an inner city family and tell them their son is given 20 years while someone in the burbs who's using powdered cocaine in greater quantities gets off with 90 day probation? Of course, we see that the same reasoning Congress made echoed the sentiments of Jim Shedd, an agent and spokesman for the Drug Enforcement Administration in Miami. He argued that it was the gangs, rivalries, shootings, and violence that goes with crack cocaine that causes these harsher sentences. He said, it's not a racist thing, but unfortunately that's what it's turned into. And look, if someone's gonna be convicted of a violent crime, then let them be convicted of a violent crime. And if someone's going to be convicted for cocaine possession, then let them be convicted for cocaine possession. As it is, it just doesn't sound quite right that it's disproportionately affecting one person over another. 
Some individuals, such as Mr. Hazel, a prosecutor in LA, insisted that these statistics weren't disproportionate to who's dealing. According to him, all the complaints and protests pouring in were like, why aren't more Chinese people being arrested when Chinese people aren't dealing the drugs? The thing is, this still implies that more black people are using, right? But the statistics don't actually show that. They actually show that white people use it the same, if not more. Their 1995 article continued and says, although federal statistics find that half of crack users are white, the sale and use of the substance, a cheaper form of cocaine, is often concentrated in poor urban minority communities, experts say. Last year, 90% of those convicted with federal crack offenses were black, 3.5% were white, sentencing commission officials say. By contrast, 25.9% of those convicted on federal powdered cocaine charges were white, 29.7% were black and 42.8% were Hispanic. When we saw those statistics, said Judge Richard P. Conaboy, the Sentencing Commission's chairman, our theory was a law, no matter how well-intentioned it was, if it's causing such discrepant results, then the law has to be changed and a new method has to be installed. Now, I agree with this mostly, with the judge on all but one point. How well-intentioned was it really? And that's something we probably won't know the answer to. Now, before we continue on to discuss why the war on drugs was doomed from the start, I wanna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor. There's so much going on in this world. It doesn't matter if you're excited to listen to new podcasts, maybe you're listening to mine right now with some Raycons or some stuff you'd rather not think about and just listen to music and just go off and disassociate for a little bit. You can't always be in control of the vibes out there, but you can always control the vibes in your head with a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds in your ears. And you guys know I've been using Raycons for way too long. I take Casper on walks, just pop them in and they're good to go. They're durable, they're rugged. Casper's definitely tried to sniff or eat them out before. Still not successful, but he has tried. So they're dog proof, at least they're Casper proof. And the new everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever, which is also just an added bonus. Bonus. Right now, all Prism of the Past listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order if you go to buyraycon.com slash prism. That's buyraycon.com slash prism to save up to 15% off on Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash prism. Try a new pair today and escape the chaos around you. While I typically try not to speak too much about intentions and speculations on this channel, as we can't know what's actually in someone's mind, every so often they voice it pretty loud and clear. In 1994, a Nixon advisor and key figure in the Watergate scandal admitted that the war on drugs was, at its core, a political tool to fight people Nixon hated, the black people and the hippies. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people, former Nixon domestic policy chief John Ehrlichman said. You understand what I'm saying. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, he said. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Even though we, and plenty of other sources, can speculate and say that this was racist, this was the first time that the war on drugs was plainly categorized as such by someone from the inside, someone who would have known Nixon's true purpose. Frankly, I do believe him. First, because it sure doesn't make him look good to say it, so it's not as if he has anything to gain out of saying this. And secondly, there's so much evidence to support it too. Stories of so-called crack babies circulated around that time, routinely portraying crack users as black, scary, and threatening, even though just as many, if not more white people were actually using crack. The war on drugs created such a sickening stigma around drug use that black people struggled to get the help they needed because they were seen as less than. Delaware even seriously debated bringing back the whipping post and public whippings in 1989 to crack down on drug use, which is insanely twisted. It sounds like something that was coming straight out of an Onion article, but it, it's not. That was a real idea that they put out there. The war on drugs was a war on black people and people of color from the start. When George W. Bush took the White House office, his administration zealously focused on marijuana use and he even promoted the idea of suspicionless student drug testing, even when research showed that drug testing in schools doesn't reduce or discourage drug use. Some sources have even called Bush's war on drugs his biggest failure as he more than doubled the federal drug control budget needlessly. 
He did this based on, well, the Washington Post calls it his instinct. I'm personally more inclined to call it his bias, stupidity, or arrogance, but we both agree on one thing. It wasn't evidence. They add, his policies at home and abroad produced a new age of mass incarceration that turned the US into the greatest jailer of its own people in the world. Bush's drug war policies also deepened an impulse towards foreign intervention that has produced questionable results. In 2014, there were 1.5 million drug arrests with about 80% being possession only, and half of those were for marijuana. The prison population reached over 2 million with so many of these kinds of arrests disproportionately being people of color. The zero tolerance policy sparked despicable attitudes among law enforcement, like police chief Daryl Gates, who stated, and I quote, casual drug users should be taken out and shot. What's the worst thing about this statement? He's the same man who founded the DARE education program. Yet again, there's far more fallout from the war on drugs. Syringe access programs that could reduce the rapid spread of HIV AIDS were also inhibited by these strict policies and the militarization of law enforcement escalated with over 40,000 paramilitary style SWAT raids. Of course, in recent years, we've seen the war on drugs slowly dialing back as support fades and prison populations have decreased too. Maybe it's because people have realized what a massive failure it was, but drug laws have been softening now and marijuana is legal in about half of the US. Even the Office of Justice Programs has an article published in their virtual library detailing just how badly the war on drugs failed once again, repeating these same depressing statistics we've heard about the black communities being targeted under these laws. Reports from the Global Commission on Drug Policy have agreed and pointed to countries that have actually decriminalized drugs and seen real declines. That source reads, Portugal saw declines in heroin use, new HIV infections, and the incarceration rate once it coupled the decriminalization of all drugs with treatment policies. Similar drops in problematic drug use, especially heroin, were observed in both Switzerland and the Netherlands after adopting policies that emphasize treatment rather than criminalization. While the report says certain law enforcement strategies can help manage and shape illicit drug markets, poorly designed ones, on the other hand, can make matters worse. The commission cited a recent study published in the International Journal of Drug Policy that found aggressive law enforcement interventions in drug markets can markedly increase levels of violence. Heavy investing in a criminalization approach can inadvertently lead to an arms race between law enforcement and violent trafficking organizations, making those markets more ruthless and increase the homicide rates. Arresting and punishing drug users tend to have a marginal and short-lived impact on drug prices and availability and create market opportunities for replaceable low-level dealers. I won't pretend that this is without a doubt the perfect solution, but investing in public health to combat the painkiller and heroin epidemic and decriminalizing marijuana are all very valuable first steps that we're beginning to take. But honestly and truly, it's not enough. We need to keep moving forward and changing how we view this supposed war on drugs, namely seeing it for the failure that it was. Now, though I can't really summarize decades worth of racism and injustices into one episode, I really hope that this tip of the iceberg has helped to at least bring some sort of attention or awareness to this issue. So with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode. I hope you learned something new. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to spend it here with me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.